Hi, I'm, I'm Matt Green. And I'm Rick Biggerstaff. And the title of our talk is Authentic Computational Thinking in a Project-Based Public High School. And we're going to share with you how we use Wolfram language to get after computational thinking with mathematics and computer science in our school. We're going to spend some time this afternoon with you talking about our experience with computational thinking in our project-based public high school in Spokane, Washington. I want to talk about four things today. They're not of equal weight. We're going to spend most of our time on the third one. We're going to talk first briefly about how we view computational thinking. We're going to talk a little bit about us and our school. We're going to talk about how we saw and in some cases didn't see computational thinking happen with the Wolfram language in our school. And then we're going to talk about where we're going next. So first, I'll start by talking a little bit about how we see computational thinking. As you may know, there's some conversation out there about what actually is computational thinking. So we've distilled it down to this. We want students to use computation to think in new ways. And we're attempting to align ourselves with the man who gave us that fat phrase, computational thinking, Seymour Papert. So a couple salient quotes from him that absolutely are the language we're speaking. He said, the goal is to use computational thinking to forge ideas. And we agree with him when he said his central focus is not on the machine, but on the mind. So in the examples we share with you today, this is really about how students are learning to think computationally. We are process nerds. We're going to get into how are they thinking, how do we know, how do we take them to the next step. And we're really excited about what the Wolfram language has allowed us to do as educators to get inside our students' heads. So you're going to hear some excitement from us today. I'm going to do this without my glasses. So first of all, a little bit about our school. As Matt said, we're from Spokane, Washington, east side of the state. We are one of three high schools in this particular district. We're not the largest district in the, in the city of Spokane. We're the second largest three high schools. We are the third. We are a non-traditional high school. Um, no bells, no whistles, no classrooms. We teach in a collaborative manner where Matt and I are teaching partners. And we view ourselves not as teachers with our students, but collaborators. Um, we have a wide spectrum of socioeconomic background with our students. We have students who come from the wealthiest families of Spokane. And we have students who sleep in their cars the night before. We have a great diversity, probably a lower um, socioeconomic average than even our district has. So we're not a magnet school. Uh, we are project-based, entrepreneurship and STEM focused, and our students have a one-to-one -one laptop ratio. So when they walk in, they're handed an Apple laptop with full access to the internet 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's their knowledge base. Quite unique as a school when it comes to this. Uh, there's not another like school like this in Spokane, no public school like this in Spokane. We struggle to find other public schools like this in the, in the country, as a matter of fact, especially being public. So to give you some background, we want to tell you a little bit about our journey. Uh, I'm in my, my 30th year of teaching high school mathematics. Matt is in your 14th or so 14th. year. As a matter of fact, he's one of my former students. <laughs> Uh, we taught together at a school I spent 23 years at in Spokane. It was in the other district, that's the large district. School about 2,200 students. Uh, traditional school. And when Matt we was available to be a teacher, I kind of recruited him and together we taught at that school. We've both been department chairs at that place. Um, I went on to become a, a district coordinator in the larger district in our city. So, so I sent, spent five years as an administrator working with teachers and curriculum at the high school and college and at the national level also. It was during this time where Matt and I together were exploring with ideas that might push the boundaries of what happens in a traditional classroom. And probably the biggest frustration we had is we really were trying to get to true problem solving with our students in math. They walk into our class at nine o'clock in the morning, leaving the English class, and in 52 minutes, we were to get them thinking deeply about solving real problems and thinking mathematically. Mm -hmm. We found it very challenging. <laughs> it was our passion to work on this, mm -hmm. and we pushed and we pushed and we pushed. Matt had an opportunity to move to a, a new setting where that might allow a little more freedom, and that's at River Point Academy. At that time, I was actually working at a local university in their math department, and I was actually teaching a math class at that school as on staff at this university. At that time, at River Point Academy, our school had a pullout model for mathematics, and that is River Point Academy is an interdisciplinary approach to curriculum. They don't go to English class. They don't go to science class. They were working on it all day, all along all together, except for one class. And that, of course, is math. 
So when River Point Academy was started, it didn't want to be that way, but they couldn't figure out how to do it other ways. Yeah. They studied schools around the country. Who else is doing this differently? And came up quite short. So at that time, I was teaching a pre-calculus class from a university, getting students college credit while they were there. We had a pull-out model in mathematics for River Point Academy. I then had an opportunity to move to River Point Academy as a teacher, and then Matt and I are now back together again <laughs> in that location, and we put our brains together and said, we have to do this differently. Okay. How can we have a school where the mathematics is integrated into everything they do. Mathematics and computer science integrated. That's what we want. That is our ultimate goal, and we're not there yet, but that's our ultimate goal. So we went to our staff and said, can we take over mathematics and computer science in this school? We'll work with all 9th through 12th graders. Our school has about 160 students. We'll work with all of them. We just want to work on the math and computer science because we see math and computer science as the same. They have different skill sets, yes, but when you talk about higher level processing skills, those are the same. Whether you're thinking about it, whether you're actively writing code or actively trying to solve a problem purely in mathematics, the same part of your brain's active. And we believe in that, so we see mathematics and computers as the same. We're trying to help our community, which is a very conservative community, see them the same. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. So our goal was to move in that direction, and that brings us to the beginning of last year. And at that point, we want to say, how can we get about doing this? And we, we decided, as we, as we talked about doing this is, we believe that that can occur when the following has happened. Students ex experience balance in mathematical practice and skills. There has to be a balance there. We're a very skill-driven mathematical society, especially in Spokane. I've been in arguments with school board members over that idea. We also want to make sure that students have access to professional tools and students solve real problems, not just exercises. That math problem we solve in 52 minutes is not a problem. It's just an exercise. Can we get to real problems? That was our goal. We actually wanted to tackle all three of those in the first year. <laughs> <laughs> we got kicked in the tail again, as we have for all of our career. Oh, Couldn't too much to bite off. So it turns out that we actually ended up tackling the first two last year, gained a lot of learning, and we're actually working on the third one this year. We're going to share all those details with you. So in the, one of the first things of the first year is students experience balance in mathematical practice and skills. If you're not familiar with the Common Core State Standards in the United States, we have a set of standards. They were developed by the states, not the federal government. And all the states said, hey, let's get together. What makes good learning in mathematics for students to be in K-12 moving into post-K-12 experiences? There's two sets. There's the core, and that is what skills should they have, and then what thinking skills should they have, what processes should they have. The processes are called the standards for mathematical practice. And simply said, when students are engaged in the practices of mathematical practice, standards for mathematical practice, you are seeing young mathematicians think like math mathematicians. They're acting like mathematicians. There are eight of those standards. The skills are the easy ones to get at. We all know that. Gosh, remind me, we actually have Khan Academy doing that for us mm -hmm. because we can do that. Siri does it really well also. <laughs> They're important, but we wanted our energy around the mathematical practices. We focused on two of them. And the reason we focused on these two, look for and make use of structure and express regular um, repeated reasoning. We focused on those two out of the eight because when Matt and I look at mathematics and you step far enough back, it seems to be three big ideas. Number, K4 focuses on number. After K4, you start moving into abstraction. Equality really starts to play a significant role. As you move into abstraction, equality, it's around equality, and rate of change. K-12 mathematics can kind of fall with those three big headers. Number, equality, rate of change. These mathematical practices focus on equality, and that's what we wanted to watch. We want to say, will students, will students if they're engaged in the mathematical standards, um, can they get at, that, at those two by writing code? That was our question. We wanted to know more about that. So we were look, those were some of our, that was one of our guiding questions when it comes to that. Access to professional tools. We thought, we have Khan Academy to help us with our skills. What will we have students do to engage in higher level thinking? Because we don't stand in front of our students and talk. That's not what we do. We stand beside them. They're working all day long. And it didn't take long for us to fall on Wolfram language. We thought this is the ticket. The, no the notebook where they can do mathematics, think computationally, write code, all of that's in a notebook makes a lot of sense. So we launched with Mathematica, Wolfram language. Matt contacted Wolfram. We got some pricing. We have it in all of our students' hands. That's the tool we want. That's the professional tool we put in our students' hands to think this way. Um, and so the guiding questions we have is, is Wolfram language accessible to all students? That's all students, not just most of them, but all of them. That's what we're after. 
And we also want to see what effect that would have on persevering through difficult situations. That's also one of the mathematical practices. Will they persevere? Will it help or will it shut them down? That was our guiding questions through this. So those are the first two that we really focused on last year, it turns out. And what we did is we, we created some activities for them to engage in. And while they're engaged in those, we looked over the shoulders and looked specifically at those ideas, those guiding questions. Are they doing those things? So some of the things we did. We did a couple things. We created some activities for them in which students could engage in the Wolfram language. And you'll recognize these. Uh, they're right out of the online notebook. And the things that we started to see were these. Students are very concrete. When we had them start plotting and making, working with lists, and we wanted them to act on a list, what they wanted to do is just write out the list. Oh, the list of three times the numbers one through 10, I'll just write in three, six, I'll just do that. Can they step to that level of abstraction where they see lit, the idea of range 10 is actually playing the role as a list? That's a step in abstraction. It was fascinating to watch them move toward that step. Can they see the equality between what range 10 does and what the list it is it's making. That was a big step for them, but that was some of our introductory things we were working on them with. And then moving past that, this is just more evolution. We wanted to see, can they go from range into table? That was really hard for them. They wanted to stay with range because they were comfortable with this. It became concrete to them. So when we asked them to do more complicated things and introduced them to the idea of table, they didn't want to let go of range. They kept trying to do it with table. Excuse me, they didn't want to let go of range. They kept trying to do it with range. We wanted them to move into table. So their first steps into table were actually quite archaic, and they looked a lot like range. Could we get them to step beyond that and move into what table can do with this functional power? And as we watch them do that, we, we don't tell them how to do it. We just watch and see what things that are doing are they engaging in? <laughs> are they persevering? Are they seeing the connections to equality as they do that? And we saw that they were. All at different rates, but they were reaching these things. And this was given to most of our students. They had one of these a, one of these a, week, a week to do, and they were there were several on each one of them. Continuing further, more work the table. And this was fascinating. Could they start to see table as a function with a domain? That was very abstract for them. That now what they're seeing is something, it's equivalent to the list, and it generates the list. And you can act on that list. Can you see it as a generator when it comes to that? And can you do things with it? And when they did this, and they slowly got there, and they got to this point, we asked them to start doing things with the list they made, like making list plots. And then what they found out was, that's too much to write. If I just call the table something like Dave, I can just do a list plot on Dave. Once again, equality. They're seeing these as equivalent forms. And this is something that we were seeing in students naturally going toward and using effectively that we weren't seeing before, before we were doing this with Wolfram language in the years we taught at the high school together. We weren't seeing these things. The other thing that showed up is we watch over their shoulder about, do they know where the brackets go? Does the bracket go there or does it go there? And to watch them, the quick response from, from language saying, hey, it's not giving you what you want, because they knew what they were supposed to get. And I'm not getting it, why? And to watch them manipulate the bracket, once again, how does the structure work? What's happening in that? So we, were rare, we, we never told them how to do any of this. We yeah. just patiently bit our lips and watched yeah. and saw where they were going with this information. But it was fascinating to see. And once again, the focus on equality. Do they see these as equivalent forms? And that feedback loop was so fascinating. Like we said, we're process nerds, right? So trying to not jump in as they're working on something and they're doing it very inefficiently. And we have to just say that from the top. If our value is efficiency first, we lose learning. Real learning is inefficient, it's messy, it's problematic. So as teachers, we have to have the courage to kind of go, okay, I could help you do that and we could be done in five seconds, but that actually takes the learning from you. Watching them struggle and make these connections, and we would share with each other these stories about, oh, Billy today, you should have seen it. He put his right bracket following the second <laughs> parameter. Because we knew that that was an indicator of moving up these levels of abstraction. It got us really excited. As Rick mentioned from the top, um, we're not where we want to be yet. We're going to talk to you a little bit with our time remaining about next year. But one more thing before we get there, <clears throat> before we get to this notion of students solving real problems and not just playing with exercises, the examples Rick has showed you, they are academic exercises. They're from the elementary introduction to the Wolfram language, which, by the way, is flipping fantastic. Yeah, that's really cool. It's, it, I mean, it should be. Anybody who's used it goes, yeah, obviously it is. <laughs> we had to spend a couple weeks making our own problems of the week, <laughs> which was super hard and not very good. And we're like, why do we not just use what exists? Yeah. So we had to learn that one the hard yeah. way. 
Uh, we're going to show you some other academic exercises, but these were intended for students who looked at this step-by-step -step process and were bored. They were not interested in being brought step-by-step -step through these things. So for these students, and we made all these options available to the whole student body at any time. If you wanted to not do the problem of the week this week and join our Project Euler conversation, you were welcome to do that. We wanted them to have the freedom to choose. I think I might be ready for that. So Project Euler, if you're not familiar, is a set of mathematical exercises that are computationally difficult. So the goal is to write code to solve these math problems. They're academic exercises, but they're interesting puzzles. And the unifying factor for this small group, it was about 15 kids that would kind of grow and shrink in size throughout the year. The unifying factor was curiosity. They saw these as puddles, puzzles, and they weren't held back by the fact they did not understand how to use the Wolfram language. We tied into that curiosity and used that as a way to get them playing with the Wolfram language. So we're going to show you a couple examples. And again, these are not efficient solutions. And that's not the point, right? Efficiency will come. We trust that. That's not our role as K-12 math and computer science educators, is to get you to be amazingly efficient. Our goal is to get you to think about your thinking and to know how to improve your processes. So one of these is from Quinn. Pretty straightforward problem. They actually give you the formulas for how to find triangular triangular, pentagonal, and hexagonal numbers. You can see Quinn wrote three functions for that. And then what's interesting about this, if you look at Quinn's code, and we'd encourage you, this is on Pathable if you want to play with this. If you pull the timing statement off of here and look at the outputs from his three tri, pent, and hex functions here, is his combination of a for loop and then the so and reap allows Quinn to peek into what's happening in the for loop. And that was very, very important for Quinn, who was a fast learner but was a new programmer the year before he came to us. He'd had some experience in Unity before he came to us, never touched Mathematica. He needed to see what was happening. So those outputs were really essential for him. I don't think that's an efficient use of those things, but it didn't matter because it made sense to him. It's the same argument that I make. I made it through my undergraduate math degree only solving systems by substitution. I would go out of my way to algebraically, algebraically rearrange something because I was confident with that tool. It's very similar to what we see these kids doing. Next example is Jenna. And her output is even more verbose. She has less experience than Quinn even. Hadn't actually programmed much before she came to us. This problem was very interesting. Convert the digits into actually written words. And there's a function in Mathematica, of course, called integer name, which does this, but there's a problem. The format of those numbers is different than the expectation of format for the Project Euler problem, particularly the hyphen. Integer name produces these long names like 243, and it puts a hyphen in there. But you can't have the hyphen if you're going to submit your answer, because it's going to get your character count off when you submit it to Project Euler. So Jenna, as you see looking through her work, used integer name in certain subcases. And again, you see her output because she needed this as part of her development to see, is this working? Is this making sense? And then other places where integer name didn't serve her, like here for a decade, she created some end arounds. So again, very inefficient, but some beautiful thinking here. And she was a very, very, very proud of this work. She'd been attending all first semester, hadn't figured one out yet, and got this one. So when we asked her coming to the conference, would you share with us some stuff you've done? She said, I'd love to share this one because she's proud of her work. So to summarize real quick, we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. Let's revisit our three guiding questions for year one before we talk about year two. We wanted to know, can students actually engage? Is, is our thinking that the kind of thinking in writing code and doing mathematics, these mathematical practices, can you actually engage in that as a student by writing code? We believe the answer is very clearly yes. We believe that it is accessible to all students, this notion of professional tools is what our school is built on. We have laser cutters, CNC machines, 3D printers, the best professional software, because we want you using the professional tools from the very beginning. That is crucial for you in your status as a learner. So was Wolfram one of those tools that was accessible? Oh my goodness, yes. And then will we see perseverance? Will they actually continue to persist? And there's a few quotes I skipped for sake of time. You can look at them. One of our favorite situations that happened a lot was you, we're in an old motorcycle shop, our school. So across the room over there, you'll hear a kid exclaim. You'll kind of wander over, what's wrong? And this happened on a number of occasions. 
I just can't figure this out. One exercise on the elementary introduction problem set. And we would kind of say, well, well, maybe you should just take a little break. And they look at you like you're crazy. I can take a break. I'm frustrated because I can't figure this out. So they're frustrated, and because they're frustrated and emotionally invested, they refuse to quit. Papert called that hard fun, right? It's hard and it's fun at the same time, and part of the reason it's fun is because it's hard. We're seeing that happen across ability levels in our school, and that gets us so excited about what next year, yeah. this year, and we, we, is going to look like. We were giddy the first time we heard that, and we kept hearing it. That was really exciting. Yeah. That was a common theme. So I think we have 30 seconds to talk yeah. about this year. So, so Matt and I get bored very easily. We said, what's the next step for this? We want to get true problem solving. So we went back to the staff and said, you know what? We think we should have a class called Comp Lab, Computational Laboratory. And in that, we want students thinking deeply about data. So we've actually created a course. And to get to right to the point is we want students to be able to develop argument, be consumers and receivers of, of, of argument supported through data. And that's our current work. So it's around rhetoric. As you're engaged in argument, can you support it with data? And that's we're knee deep into it right now. One of our customers is sitting here in the, thanks for being here, Mac. And those are the things we're taking on because these should, this should lead to deep problem solving. Yeah. And we want them engaged with data. So we're actively using the Wolfram language in that course at the same time. So more to learn this year. Yeah, we, it's, we, we hope to be able to come exciting. back and tell you really more exciting. about what happens this year. So we have five minutes for Q&A. If you have anything you'd like to ask or, or talk about, we would love some interaction. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, just I had a board member who believed that we should have very specific algorithms for doing mathematics, and that's it, and that's the first focus. If they can't do that, they can't do anything else. Mm -hmm. And I just completely disagreed with them. You know, I live in a very conservative community, very supportive of education. Washington State supports education very well. But we didn't see eye to eye on that. And I was a, I was a curriculum coordinator at the time and just said, well, we're not going to do it that way. We're just not going to. And I know you can fire me, but I just can't. I can't come to work every day and know that we're only going to focus on algorithms, which is really important, but it can't be our only focus. Yeah. We went running together, too. I tried to establish a relationship with him. <laughs> I, I love hearing the stories of the students getting messy with the code and trying to figure it out. What role, if any, did model code play in your teaching? Uh, showing examples for them to hmm. Hmm. So I can take that yeah. one. Um, for the Problem of the Week track, the kids who wanted the foundational approach, we really leveraged the fact that there was expected output. And so kid by kid, and our environment really allows us to do this, we really individualize the experience. And as we build relationship with the kid, this kid's going to need a different thing than this kid. And so if this student is really struggling and needs us to step in, there were times where what we would do, if Rick was a student and I was the teacher, he'd be on his laptop in Mathematica, I'd be on my laptop. Because again, we're not trying to take the tool out of their hands. But we would say, can we think together? So we would do some thinking, and they would watch us writing some code. That was a huge aha for us when we got to come to the conference last year. Mm -hmm. Watching experts write code in front of us mm -hmm. was incredible. Another thing we didn't even talk about was when students made that shift to thinking functionally, where they build something from the inside out, I mean, those were big days. Like We're yeah. like running across the room to high five each other because like they're doing Composition. That. Composition. So there's not a clear answer because it's totally individualized to the student. But there are times where it's developmentally appropriate for us to say, well, can I show you something? And sometimes, too, where like we talked about switching from range to table, we had to pry range out yeah. of their hands yeah. because they'd come to depend on that tool so much that we're saying, hey, this tool's even better. But they didn't want to get rid of range because they were comfortable with it. And we had an example up there where it was 2n plus 1, and it produced the set they wanted. And then we looked at the graph, and we said, then we just had this question like, well, if that makes one odds, what if it was negative one? And you just watch them think. And then they'd go right to Mathematica. And yeah. <laughs> they would type it in. What if it's two n minus? Hey, it works. Yeah. So they're able to quickly see some of those equivalences that, they, that we struggle to see in our classrooms other, otherwise. Yeah. They looked at the idea of y equals mx plus b quite differently and much more openly as, as a tool for yeah. equivalence yeah. in math. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have time, have time for another for question another if you have them. I think if we can, uh, please correct me on this, Rick, if okay. I say this wrong. Okay. But I think because of our shared experience, we were careful to not expect too much. Because um, we've had a variety of experiences yeah. where we think it's reasonable and we find out, oh, no, that wasn't. So really, when we say we think this should happen, we're wondering if it will, we really didn't know. 
And the reason we're doing what we're doing in year two is because of how it went in year one. So for the same yeah. question, if you want to know, well, what comes after year two? I don't know. It depends on how far we see the students getting with it's Stephen's computational X, right? We just want to put a computational glasses on and look at whatever you're interested in and see what you can do with that with this tool. And that, now that we know it's and accessible. It was, that's why it's important for us in the beginning to identify guiding questions, identify the mathematical practice. So we stayed focused, almost like a, a case study. We didn't want to be distracted by things that we weren't trying to control or have some learning around. And when we stayed focused on the mathematical practices, we saw the mathematical practices happening in ways we had not seen before in our traditional classrooms. Yeah. And we're excited about that. Yeah. I think there were hiccups along the way, like maybe they weren't catching on to the language as fast at one time, maybe than others, et cetera. But we didn't let that distract us. It was still about, are they seeing equivalence? Are they seeing structure? Is it happening? And how do we know that we're seeing it? And what does it look like? And what does it tell us about going to our next step? <laughs> and that part, we were very, very encouraged. Encouraged enough to take the step we have this year to create a course and moving to the next level. So students now are maybe not by working about uh, Wolfram language all day long, um, for all students, but they get a deep, deep uh, involvement with it in our course. Yeah. So that's our time. If you're interested in having other conversations, we'd love to talk to you. So you just come grab us during the conference, please. Mm -hmm. And thank you again so much yeah. for being here. We thank appreciate you for being here.